For those who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it occurred at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst it was most often portrayed as a uh, techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its uh, actual aim hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, and the charismatic prophets, as well as the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was aim to cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans in engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon is the uh, or the Salon series uh, completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. The automaton was the modern wonder of the 19th century. A self-operating clockwork machine that would have the appearance of moving like a human or an animal. Originating in France, they came to reflect the curiosities and preoccupations of French society at the time, with automatons uh, coming to represent clowns, artists, and conjurers. Today's modern equivalent is the self-operating line of code, the algorithm. Algorithms be behave like humans, these new age automatons known as bots. They consist entirely of information environments they populate, but c continue to represent our preoccupations as a globalized and computerized society. Bots are fast becoming our peers, or perhaps they're not, as we'll find out later. The web has been infected by bots that take on many forms, and these software versions of mechanical robots have been studied in the hope that they might represent early forms of artificial intelligence. That tricky word, artificial intelligence, rears its head at virtual futures yet again. These software entities are claimed to be responsible for 24% of tweets. They make up over half of internet traffic. And most recently, bots have found a new home within the widely used mobile messaging ecosystem. And with apps such as Skype and uh, WeChat, Facebook Messenger and Slack, all beginning to have bot ecosystems. These bots, uh, especially in these newer systems, are commonly known as chatbots. And they attempt to hide the fact that they're non-human by attempting to imitate our web behavior. <clears throat> and they do this in order to give personalized recommendations. They are only uh, software, they, they are the only software program, sorry, that dare to imitate personality and the mannerisms of real humans. The only entities that aspire to don the mantle of being an intelligent being. But what are bots really capable of? And that's hopefully what we'll get to the bottom of, of this panel today. Are bots an extension of the self? Will we soon be able to outsource our memories, our decisions, and our tasks to artificial agents? Are bots a way of offloading work and labor? Will they become intelligent, active, and personalized collaborators? Are they perhaps a new interface for the web, with the familiar desktop metaphor being replaced by a paradigm that revolves around semi-autonomous, semi-intelligent software agents? Whatever the outcome is, it's clear that bots are increasingly infiltrating our society and how society operates. As such, new concerns have been raised over the ethics of bot creation and bot usage. What responsibilities do bot makers have to ensure that bots are created ethically? What sorts of interactions between bots and humans should we allow? What personalities might bots develop? So to explore these new relationships between humans and their software-based non-human counterparts are my three very human, at least, I, at least I hope, panelists for this evening. So I want to kick off by introducing Dr. Ben 
Kerman. So Ben is a lecturer at the University of York, and Ben has been playing uh, with bots and what bots are capable of for, for, I know, for a couple of years since you were at Lincoln, and uh, you run a you helped to run a conference called uh, Chai CHI. And Ben, the question I want to ask you is, you're using bots as the framing for human-computer interaction. You're looking at how bots are going to fundamentally change that uh, paradigm. And can you tell us some of the ways you're using bots to playfully interrogate that paradigm? I know you have some examples that you can tell us about. Yeah, sure. So I'm your token stuffy academic, I guess. Um, but I work in, I, I use a method we call research through design um, to, in, like to in, interrogate how uh, the relationship between humans and computers has developed. And basically that's kind of academic code for like thinking through making stuff. So by making things that kind of explore the potentials and the dangers of emerging technologies that happens. Uh, and that happens within this context. So CHI is a conference, happens every year. This year it was in San Jose. Uh, in the middle of Silicon Valley. And every year it's sponsored by kind of, Google and Facebook and Yahoo and, and all these people are there and everyone's presenting their latest work. Um, and if anyone's seen the TV program Silicon Valley where every product is kind of prefaced with, you know, our product is going to change the world for the better. You know, we're going to make the world a better place. Uh, it's very much that environment where te there's this techno-utopianism where all technology is always going to make the world better and so we should keep making more and more technology. Uh, so where, where, we, where we come in and some of the work we do is kind of slowing that down a bit and then critiquing it by building stuff that explores unusual opportunities provided by those advances. Um, so I was going to talk about a couple of quick examples. So first of all was um, uh, I made an, well, we designed an evil kitchen. Um, so this is a few years ago when Internet of Things was first becoming kind of a very popular thing where every device in your home would be connected to the Internet and then you'd have like a, a smart, like, Bot, your, your house would be a, a creature that would kind of look after you. Uh, but also, in this very positive way, it would kind of reward you for doing kind of things that were, would save you money or be environmentally friendly. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, what happens if the, the bot that runs your house is, is like an evil bot? Or what happens if the priority of the bot is, is the environment ahead of your well being? Um, so we designed a system where using, uh, like, uh, you know, the, the Wi Fi enabled plug sockets and flow monitors and other kind of sensors. Um, we designed a house where the evil bot would be able to kind of punish you rather than rewarding you for environmentally friendly behavior, like to encourage you to be more environmentally friendly. Uh, so for example, if, you, if you're in the shower too long using too much water, it would switch off the, the power to the hot <laughs> the heater, so you'd tell you're cold. Um, well, the best example was where um, if, if your kind of energy usage had been too high and you kept leaving, leaving the lights on, uh, when you're out of work, um, the bot would remember this, and then when you're on holiday, it'd switch off your fridge. Uh, so the, when you got home, um, you, all your food would be spoiled, and that would be your punishment for, for not behaving in an environmentally friendly way, which is all enabled by this technology, right? So although all the, the companies making this stuff had sort of said, oh, yeah, you know, it's all fantastically positive, it was, it was trivial to turn that on its head and say, well, you know, maybe bots aren't always our friends. Um, and leading on from that was uh, another example of a bot we made with um, Foursquare. So it was based on this idea that people like to be more explorative or they like to see themselves as being very adventurous. I think that's probably true for most of us in this room as you kind of consider yourself to have like an adventurous personality. So we put that to the test by making a bot that you sign up to. It monitors your Foursquare movement habits and where you, where you go in the world. And if you fall into a routine, it would issue you a challenge um, over Twitter. So it would be this, this challenge. It would challenge you to go, instead of going to the place where you always go, it would send you somewhere none of your friends have ever been, you've never been, and that Foursquare wouldn't recommend you go. And it would, it would send, you, it would send you this map to that. So you can see examples of that online. The bot broke between Foursquare API changes, unfortunately, but it's twitter.com slash getlostbot, it's called. Uh, so you can check out and you can see the sort of maps that it was sending to people. Uh, and it, we had thousands of users. It was featured in The Guardian. We had tons of, of great feedback to the idea. But then when people actually used it, they realized you know, the, the, the bot um, you know, was, it was doing as it, as it had advertised, but that wasn't exactly what they wanted. So uh, as an example, um, we had one user who I had the most hilarious bug reports for this bot. 
Uh, so one user contacted us to say that she worked in a hotel and every day she checked into the hotel that she worked at. And after a few weeks, it started to get lost spot every day at 9 a.m. would tell her to go to the pub instead. Like, try this pub, try this pub, try this pub, try this pub. Um, and we had one other user, I, I got a bug report saying, oh, there's something wrong with your system because every Sunday I go to the church, I go to the same church every Sunday, and it keeps suggesting I, go to, I try the mosque instead. <laughs> uh, which is, you know, the bot was working perfectly as advertised, but uh, the users responded very badly to it and, you know, but hopefully made them kind of reflect a little bit on, on, on you know, the difference between what the, the perceptions of what AI can do for them and then the realities. But I think what's, I've got kind of going on, sorry. <laughs> but what, I am an academic, I did say that up front, that I'm used to talking. But um, one of the really interesting things for me is this anthropomorphosis. So, people would reply to the bot and say one thing, and then they'd email me and say, your, your bot's a bit out of control, you need to fix it. The emails are going to the same place, but uh, there's, there's very much this idea that you know, the, the bot is a, it's an individual being that they can interact with uh, and, and, and kind of negotiate with. Um, and, and that kind of, the feeling of it being an entity is kind of some kind of magic that happens there that's, that's really interesting to me is that people kind of ascribe a lot of psychological things or people think the bot hates them and the bot's doing stuff to them, uh, which isn't the case. I mean, it's only a pretty simple set of scripts. Um, yeah, so this idea of, of, of bots being like creatures and having the complexities of that is, has implications positively, I guess, in some cases, but a whole wider range of negative implications. And I know we're going to return to that, that tricky word, anthropomorphism, and then the flip inverse on that, the mechanomorphism of the human, which makes some of these bots look so oddly, oddly familiar in some social platforms. It, it, it strikes me that the get lost bot, it feels like the functionality, the user experience of Pokemon Go was stolen by <laughs> get lost. Don't get talk lost. to me about Pokemon Go. So, so, well, that's perhaps something we, we always bloody bring up at Virtual Futures, despite trying to try not to. And, Look, George, I know you've been playing also with bots. You want to democratize the creation of bots. You want to uh, be able to wring them out of the, the uh, uh, halls of agencies in academia, and you want anybody to be able to create their own, their own bot. You have a, uh, I think it's a platform uh, called Cheap Bots Done Quick. Yep. Could you explain sure. where that came about and the reason for that? Sure. So, um, Cheap Bots Done Quick is a, is a it's just a website, really. <laughs> um, so it's a website, it's a platform that you can go on to and you can create a Twitter bot. Um, ideally, as simply as possible, you can go on there and, you know, 10 minutes later, you can come out with an incredibly basic bot that's, that's running, on, running on an account you control. Um, and this, this is for tw Twitter bots. Um, and so where this came about was, um, I mean, I've done some, made some bots. I'm aware of a community of people who make kind of bots for artistic purposes online. We've done some kind of interesting stuff. And um, like I also come from a kind of a games, especially a kind of indie game scene. And there's, there's some interest there as well. And I was like, I was asked to run a workshop to make Twitter bots um, for a festival my friend, friend David runs called the uh, Feral Vector, which is an indie, indie games festival. So I was asked to run this, run this workshop and I was like, yeah, sure, it's great. Making Twitter bots is great. Everyone should, everyone should do it. It's, it's really good fun. It's like it's really interesting for a bunch of reasons. And then I looked at the process of it, and it turns out it was just just all this terribleness of trying to get API keys and manage signing it, and all of this kind of just really boring, tedious work to get it set up. Um, and then you actually write the code, and the code is super simple and understandable. And you're like, wait, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. But I've already signed, agreed to run this workshop, so I ended up doing some work and making some stuff to make it easier. And by the time I got to the end of it, I'm like, oh wait, I've I've made something I can just put out there and is accessible to people. Um, so yeah, so it, it is, I mean, my interest in, in bots there comes from a position of as being a, a bit of artistic practice and a, a thing that's, that's approachable for people to do and I think that's particularly interesting because um, like most of the stuff I've done is based on Twitter because um, Twitter is a really good platform to play with for this because Tweets have to be short. You have to do it in 140 characters. So, you know, the giving that impression of a living thing, of an intelligent thing responding, it can be pretty dumb because it's responding with a complete lack of context or it's saying a particular thing. And, you know, if you try to write, you know, an article using a computer, computer-generated text, it's difficult to maintain a kind of coherent thread from beginning to end. 
and to keep the prose quality good. But if you're just doing a tweet, you can just do a kind of contextless scramble of words. And if it's taken out of context the right way, it can seem funny or interesting or insightful or can seem to spark something or suggest that there's a deeper process there when actually it really isn't. Um, yeah, what was uh, yeah, so and, and Twitter also is really good because um, generally if you're making like weird like software art, it's difficult to make people look at it because um, there's not like an established ecosystem of people looking at weird software art. There's, there's areas where that happens, but it's kind of difficult. It's not, it's not a mass market thing. But following a Twitter account that posts a funny thing, that's, that is actually fairly accessible. So you suddenly make a Twitter account and suddenly it's there. And Twitter accounts also have this kind of social context. Like it's mixed in with things that you see from everyone else kind of saying this. Like, you know, you follow your friends and then you see, um, you know, a computer generated landscape. And then you see a picture of a nice sunset that your friend takes. And it's given equal, equal priority on Twitter in a kind of nice way. Um, yeah, so I, that, that's kind of the reasons that I really like Twitter as a kind of platform for this. Um, and there's also is a reason that it makes all this stuff kind of possible to make. Like, it's possible to make something interesting as a Twitter bot. Like, if you've, if you've got a run-up and you've got some experience with it, like, in, like, an evening or a weekend, rather than a kind of super elaborate project, which you have to control all the kind of environments and the parameters of, um, and you have to start investing, like, months into it and to polish it off and to release it properly. Instead, you can just make a short, quick, messy thing and throw it out there and see if it resonates with people and then improve it. And there's a kind of natural thing of people follow it. And so you improve it and they see the improved versions and then they retweet it. And there's a natural way for, for it to find an audience in a way that you release a thing and it's, it's a single thing and it's a done or you make something for a gallery show and it gets released. And then that's, that's the single time it's going to be shown at a gallery show. And in order to do that, you need to coordinate with the people who are showing it at a gallery and get permission and answer a lot of emails and stuff like that. Instead, you just make a thing, put it online, tweet, say, hey, I made a thing. And, Maybe people like it, maybe they don't, but you've not sunk a bunch of time into anyway. So, so what would you say is the fundamental difference between, say, a chat bot and a Twitter bot? Um, so they don't have to be different. Like, I mean, in terms of one's on Twitter, one's on an instant messaging platform. Like, that's, that's the fundamental difference. With a chat bot, there's an assumption that you talk to it, it responds to you, you respond to it. There's a kind of continuous chain of conversation and like often that's to do something useful or that those should be connected. And obviously on Twitter, you can respond to a bot and then it can respond to you so you can have that same chain of conversation. And again, you could have a chat bot that doesn't respond to anything you says, but sends you something funny once a day at noon. Um, so you can have the same functionality, but the different social context you approach it in and like if you get a message on a work Slack bot, you're seeing it on your work Slack, where people are yelling at you to do things and you're having arguments about work stuff, which is different from seeing it mixed in with Twitter, where people are arguing about politics and <laughs> someone like that. So I'm, it's, it's, I'm sure we're going to have the fight over whether a bot can be defined by its ecosystem. But before we do, okay. I want to turn to Joshua Broder, who is actually our youngest panelist ever on Virtual Futures Salon with one of the youngest, brought one of the youngest audience members to Virtual Futures Salon, his sister. So everybody watch their language. Um, <laughs> this is a late night affair. Um, but Joshua, the, the, reason, the reason that I asked you to speak on this panel was something I saw recently that you um, put together that gained a lot of press, uh, especially in the UK, perhaps because of what it was helping people do, but it was called Do Not Pay Robot Lawyer which essentially was a robot lawyer that appealed, um, and maybe I've got the, uh, the number of dollars wrong, maybe it's increased since I, the last article I saw, but I hear that it was $40 million worth in parking fines over 21 months. Only $4 million, unfortunately. Only $4 million, uh, in parking fines over 21 months. Um, but th what's interesting about your work specifically is instead of going down the art route or the Internet of Things route, you've created a bot for a very specific civic purpose. Could you tell us the story of how Do Not Pay Robot came about? Yeah, I kind of got into the whole um, robot lawyer development business by accident. Um, when I turned 18, which is the driving age, um, I got a large number of parking tickets. And it was really embarrassing after about the fourth ticket, my sister would tell you, um, my parents refused to pay. And so out of necessity, I had to become this kind of local parking guru in Camden, where I lived. 
And it wasn't long before I was helping all my family and friends appeal their tickets. And I thought it would be such a cool side project to create this chatbot that helps them do it automatically. And I could never have imagined that nine months later, um, the Do Not Pay bot would have appealed um, around $4 million worth of tickets. And um, this made me realize that the issue of bots helping people with the law is bigger than just a few parking fines. So I since expanded to help with delayed flights, homelessness, PPI compensation, and just today um, challenging your landlord um, if you need repairs in your property. And one of the things I'm really excited about in the next few months is the issue of um, democratizing my bot. As George said, it's such a huge issue about um, people with no technical knowledge being able to not create bots. And so what I'm going to do in the next few months is allow any lawyer to upload a legal document and then a bot is automatically created um, for that legal document. And I hope to go from half a dozen bots, um, which is where I'm at now, to hopefully a thousand bots with that strategy. So you are going to own the UK's first fully automated law firm. Is that what you're going for? That's exactly what I'm going for. Um, and I think there are these so many exploitative lawyers who just charge hundreds of pounds just by copying and pasting documents. And I think a bot can do it. So did you, so, so the first process was I'm getting all these parking fines, let's yeah. try and help the process. But did you then consult with lawyers in the creation of these bots? How have you found that collaboration between technical expertise and, and law? It's um, quite a long process. They have to first identify an issue and propose it to me. And then I have to decide whether it's technically possible. And then they have to prepare the legal documents. And so I just want to take away that friction and just allow the lawyers that, to do it themselves without even having to type any code. So have you found any pushback from law firms where, where, you're, where you're walking into the, I mean, we, we always worry about, oh, self-driving cars are going to kill the taxi service. In actual fact, it seems to be the law firms who are at most risk, all those um, uh, sort of early trainee lawyers who will be replaced by bots. Have you found pushback from the legal community over what you're doing? Well, um, I would say 95% of lawyers support what I'm doing, surprisingly. And I think the reason that is, is because it's not going to argue in the high court anytime soon. Um, but um, there, are, there are these 5% who say um, it can never be done and the law is too complicated. I, of course, disagree with them. But lots of charities like Centerpoint in the UK have helped me out a lot. And even law firms are donating documents. So, Ben, I wonder, giving... Giving bots the ability to make legal decisions, I mean, I don't want to open this can of worms so early, but there's going to be a massive ethical issue related to that, I would assume? Sure, yeah, so I think, well, first of all, like, none of what I'm about to say is a criticism of, <laughs> of Do Not Pay itself, which is a fantastic service and, uh, and it does some fantastic work there, but um, I'm kind of worried that you might have inspired you know, we're already kind of, um, our inboxes are full of messages from PPI lawyers already. So I wonder, you know, is, is Twitter soon going to be overrun by uh, people who have re-implemented the do not pay uh, PPI? Uh, but also then, the, because it's dealing with these kind of legal issues is, like, I'm kind of, you know, internally I'm kind of worried about the kind of uh, liability issues if, what if, what if someone gets the kind of slightly wrong advice here or what if, um, what if somebody builds a bot that that doesn't just follow the procedure and, go, and goes further than dealing with the very procedural issues that, that the robot lawyer deals with at the moment and starts dealing with kind of wider legal issues uh, that are kind of much more complex and nuanced and uh, you know like there's, there's, there's some potential for some kind of problems um, there. I mean, so at the moment it, it's great because the robot lawyer does deal with these very procedural things. It's um, it's able to um, to help people kind of generate these letters based on these very specific questions that it does ask, and, it, and it, so it's very well done in that way. But as it expands, you know, like where's, like where do you stop making robot lawyers? Is the question, I guess. And I, I wonder, have you have you received any of that feedback? Are you sort of aware of that feedback? How are you navigating this tricky environment of robot lawyers? Um, well, it's a really important concern, uh, and it's inappropriate to ignore. Um, I think as I expand, I'm going to have this approval process. So it's not as if the Tay bot, which some of you might be familiar with, where it will just accept the responses and then shape its 
additional responses on that. And there will be still lawyers checking to see if it's appropriate. Um, but I am really worried because there are so many unethical issues that bots could be created for. Um, for example, even with my own website, people have tried to create bots um, to take it down, botnets. Uh, or with my own website, people could create a bot, for example, to avoid taxes, which is highly unethical. So I think a strong approval process is really important. And George, and I know both Ben has very strong opinions of Taybot. Taybot was, well, perhaps you can explain yeah. Taybot. Microsoft's Taybot that sure. turned into a Nazi racist in the course of, I think it was 15 minutes or so. Yeah, I'm, yeah, probably about that time. Uh, yeah, no, so they, Microsoft set up this chatbot that had all this machine learning things on, and then um, so this was a Twitter bot as well. Um, and uh, they talked to Twitter to deliberately get Twitter to disable all the rate limits on how fast it could respond to people, got it verified, launched it with a big splash of publicity, and it, and it, it had the like, um, like non-human checked kind of thing where it would say stuff, people would respond, and then it would use those responses to form what it responded to other people with. So it was this kind of self-driven, self learn self-learning thing. So they unleashed it on the internet. People on the internet responded in a very predictable way, said very predictable things to it, figured out that they could teach it to reliably make certain responses to things, and, and then, then people were talking to it, and it was unprompted coming up with um, stuff about not, like, yeah, Nazi stuff, just, just completely inappropriate stuff, all of which in the persona of a uh, you know, chirpy teen girl. Um, which obviously made the incongruity even worse. Um, and then after, I don't know, like less than a day, um, it got so much bad publicity that Microsoft had to pull it down and just kind of quietly say, mm, yes, and, and walk away. And hopefully not do similar things too soon in the future. But Ben, is that, is that an issue of bot making or is that an issue of what the internet looks like right now? Is that humans, <laughs> not bots, that's the problem there? Um, well, it's, it's proper research, I guess. Like it was, it was so mind blowing that uh, a corporation the size of Microsoft could get that far, you know, <laughs> to actually releasing this thing without without somebody having said, you know, this this might not work out. You know, you wouldn't send your child to be get edu educated at, at 4chan or by Reddit users. Um, and so the idea that you know you could have this this simple algorithm be trained by random people on the internet without it being subverted. It's I mean, it, it, was a, it was a problem to me that basically the, the root cause of the problem was they had super AI experts working on it and then they had presumably some company sign off and approvals and all of that kind of stuff designing it. And then uh, as far as I can see, they never looped in anyone who'd made bots or made user generated stuff or had made similar things before, or if they did, they then ignored the feedback they gave to them. So it's, as far as I can see, is like, you should have talked to any of the people who currently make bots on the internet as to the kind of things you have to deal with when you make bots on the internet versus going, no, no, no it's fine, we know AI, it's fine, we'll sort it. So, so what is it about today's sort of chat bots that we're beginning to see pop up in messaging platforms? What makes them slightly safer than, say, Taybot? Well, what is the fundamental difference between something that it sort of emerges its personality or its uh, or its way of being on the on the web versus something like a chatbot that's designed for a messenger platform. Are there fundamental differences there? I just want to get to the sort of yeah. crux of so, we can't. Not every bot is the same. Is pretty, pretty much all of the ones we've talked about so far that that us three have made have have been explicitly authored like the content from it. I mean, in, in Josh's case, explicitly lawyers have went over it and checked that it works as legal advice. From my side, some people have written it and uploaded it to the site, and then there's a moderation process on my side so I can see stuff that's beyond the pale and take it down. But, you know, like, it's made by a human author, and then I've loaded, and then people interact with it, and it responds in those limited ways versus anyone can say anything to it, and that's used as content and shown to other people. Like. You know, like, um, if you remember, like, chat roulette and Omegle, where connect two strangers and then they can have a conversation and imagine what they're going to talk about. And it's, like, pretty easy to imagine what they're going to talk about. And that's what the platform's become, is just people yelling abuse at each other and kind of the super base level of things. And without some moderation, without some designing for putting stuff unmoderated onto the internet, designing for people, that's what you get. And Ben, do you think people are going to want conversations with... Hilton bot via Facebook Messenger, is that just the, is this just another 
spike in bot creation, the same spike you saw with the Internet of Things, was it three years ago? Yeah, so uh, I, I know conversational agents is something that's been around for decades that you know, people have said, oh, well, even, so even back in the kind of 50s and 60s, they were building these kind of robots that would have someone on stage speaking to the robot and the robot would do the thing that it was supposed to and you know, this has been around forever. And so there's this kind of a huge cultural weight of expectation is when, when you say something's a robot or something's a bot, is that that means that you can speak to it and it's, and it's an entity that's able to, to respond um, versus the reality, which is what happened to Tay uh, by when you actually try to, to put stuff, that stuff online without this heavy moderation, without this heavy authorship. Um, yeah, so because of this kind of huge, huge weight uh, of expectation is like, um, is that, you know, it's never going to match the kind of reality of, of what the bot's capable of doing. So there's always going to be some kind of disappointment when you, when you ask the Hilton bot, you know, what's the, you know, why is it, why does it exist and what's the meaning of life? You, you're always going to be disappointed with that answer <laughs> that it's going to give you, uh, right? Because, uh, because, you know, your, your expectation of the capabilities of bots is very different than the reality of a, a few scripts hosted on a server somewhere, and this heavily edited conversation tree, the keywords that it's capable of responding to. Should, should, I mean, should organizations, not to, well, we do have to challenge these, these brand bots, but should organizations be aware of those sort of questions coming up? It's like the, the old joke within Red Dwarf, Talkie the Toaster's resum d'etre is I toast, therefore I am. Every, his meaning of life for, for that bot is burnt bread and toasted bread and perfectly toasted bread. I mean, should Hilton bot have some sort of fascination with togs of pillows. It's, it's meaning of life is, is a perfectly fluffed duvet or something. Should they be aware of that playfulness? Should we allow for personality to emerge in these functional bots? Or should we quash the ability for uh, whether it's a bot that you're creating or the Hilton bot or, or robot lawyer to have a personality? Although some of the lawyers I've met struggle with having a personality in their own rights. But how do you feel about that? Ben, should we allow for emergent personalities to occur within bot systems? Like, <laughs> that's, that, that's like a really complicated, like that, that's something people have worked on for decades and never got right. And it's, Why? It's Why, so Why are we still struggling with that personality issue? It's, it's really, really hard maths <laughs> is the answer. Um, but there's, there's a disconnect between uh, what people understand by AI and the reality of it. And, um, and especially in the kind of marketing kind of perspective, is that because people jump to this conclusion, well, let's just say artificial intelligence is a code word for magic, is, is where, what I'm getting at really, is that you say that your system has some clever AI behind it, and people interpret that as, oh, this system is magically, technologically advanced. Um, so that, but there's no need to fill in that gap. There's no need for Hilton to go and spend the billions of dollars it would require to make this kind of hugely complex um, computer system. They could just say they've done it. <laughs> and, that's and then do some pre-canned answers about the tog of the pillows or whatever um, for, for when that comes up. So anyone that's going to use Siri, so if you look, look back at this kind of Siri announcement video where Apple announced it and said, you know, what a revolution this conversational agent is, and it's got a name, and it's like, it's like a real thing, and then your kind of real everyday example, like, like how you interact with that on a day-to-day -day basis is, like, there's a vast gulf of difference there. So I don't know if that's changing, like, are, are people getting this kind of AI or bot fatigue, where they're starting to see through these kind of false promises? Um, or, or are people still as game as ever to say, oh, oh it's got clever AI, that, that must be brilliant. Certainly so looking at Kickstarter, if you look at Kickstarter projects, and there's so many of them that you know, say, oh yeah, we've got a revolutionary AI system behind it, without, without any further kind of information, that it's kind of cynically, I'm like, well, that's a random number generator. Effectively, or, or you know, you as do, your system you is, you could do great like, things with the random number yeah, generator. <laughs> you know, but when we're, you know, we're talking about the, the grand challenges of artificial intelligence, you know. but Josh, yeah. you made the move from here in London in the UK to Stanford in yeah. California. Are you finding those same sort of challenges, and how are you counteracting those challenges of people going, "Oh, you created an AI lawyer"? Yeah. Uh, well, I actually disagree a bit. I mean, I have very limited experience and don't have any degrees to my name, but... Um, but four million uh, yeah. dollars worth of parking tickets. But um, 
I think there is a lot of hype and we have to be very careful. But the thing that's unique about today, which has never happened before, is the huge companies are pouring billions of dollars into bots and even the underlying AI technology. It's no longer pre-canned responses. For example, Facebook acquired wit.ai and they're making big investments in that. And the founders of Siri even have started a new company funded by hundreds of millions of dollars to um, create this new technology. And so the issue I'm struggling is, um, with is where this money is going. So I think it really is going to develop better technology. And because there is such big investment, it, there is hope. But at the moment, it's not there. But then what is the what is the end goal? Is it talking toasters and talking fridges? I mean, where are they seeing the market? We saw the IoT promise, your fridge and your toaster will talk to each other, the, the evil kitchen example that you gave. And that was three years ago, and that sort of died a withering death. And Twitter bots re-emerge and disappear, re-emerge and disappear based on the new fascination with bots. I mean, is there a is there a goal for where these software agents are going to exist and live and interact with us? So, so, just to, so we had this sort of a slight discussion before about this, but just to clarify that you know there are many fantastic uses for AI, and don't want to disparage the entire kind of field of AI. But in this kind of human-facing kind of thing, I kind of wonder. It's like for me, it's like why, why? Why are you doing this? Like, why, you know, if Siri can do these basic things and I know the vocabulary of Siri to get to do what I needed to do, but like, why does it need to be, why does it need to have kind of a soul behind it? <laughs> do, do, do you have a thesis on the why? I know, I know for. Sorry. So, so my, my thing here is this is not like the second hand thought, but like AI is basically anything that computers can't do yet. Like, um, Image recognition is increasingly getting good. Like uh, automated translation is increasingly getting good. Like there's there's lots of practical applications of AI, but as soon as it starts working reliably, you stop calling it AI and you just start calling it whatever the task is. You know, um, like you know, like it's like oh use Google Translate and you're like okay cool, but you don't think of it as oh use use AI to solve this problem because it's just Google Translate and you, you don't think about it. It stops being AI basically as soon as we've solved it. So what you guys are saying is someone says they've got an AI, be very, very wary of what's in their little black box. Yeah, no, it, 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 it might, might well work, but as soon as everyone gets used to it, they'll stop calling it AI and start calling it something else. So AI is always the thing that computers will do tomorrow and whatever they can do reliably today stops being AI because it turns out to be a different thing. And Josh, what was interesting about your work, other than the creation of the bots, is the fact that you revealed something very systematic in society. Well, you were able to create that bot purely because parking tickets work by a certain system. Yeah. And I think that reflection on how society works and the fact that you can robotify what's happening is, is interesting. Could you talk to that a little bit? I know we mentioned it talks about it on the phone. Um, so when parking tickets are issued in the UK, I think they're issued mostly unfairly. I th uh, nationally, if you challenge a parking ticket, you're um, half as, you have a 50% chance of getting out of it, whether you use my bot or not. My bot gives you a 60% chance. And I think that just shows. <laughs> and it's not AI, so he can be believed. It's just it? algorithms. Um, and. Um, so I think it shows that there's this underlying problem um, in society and um, technology can do that very efficiently. Um, the same is true with homelessness. When you, um, to get legal aid in the UK, you have to s submit a homelessness application without the help of a lawyer on your own first. And um, if a bot could do that, then you can do it instantly, get the legal aid if they reject the initial application. So I think there are these so, so many problems in, and bureaucracies in society that bots can kind of overcome just by doing that themselves. And it's interesting, the revelation that it is so, the ability to turn a very complicated process into something very, very systematic. Yeah. Is interesting that it is so easy, easy to do. Yeah. Um, the only problem that I have is what happens if 
if the other side of the coin starts robotifying the way in which they work. So we have the fact that the societal construct around how tickets are issued is, is a system in its own right. But what happens if we start having uh, robots issuing tickets and then robot lawyers fighting yeah. robot parking attendants or uh, what would be commonly known as a nine-eye camera on top of a self-driving car walking around looking for cars? Will we just have this constant churn system of bots talking to bots talking to bots because the other worry potentially is if we all have as the promise was back in 2011 we'll all have a personalized little bot that would be a version of us that we could send onto the social web to escape the filter bubble so we won't have adverts targeted towards us anymore would mess up the the uh, ad tracking uh, systems but then what is talking to those bots? Would it be a bot version of us talking to a bot version of Hilton or a bot version of a brand? Would it be bots talking to bots talking to bots? I know, Ben, you've written a, a very playful paper. Um, I think it was called uh, The Future Robot Enslavement of Humankind. Yeah. It was an academic paper exploring yeah, uh, that partly kind of, that. That was a weird one. Uh, <laughs> yes, in that paper we asserted, uh, so myself and the co-authors, um, so Dan's one of them, uh, asserted that we were robots from the future um, and we come back come back through time to come and tell people about the horrible effects of kind of unchecked technological process yeah and they got peer-reviewed and then accepted so I guess that means I am a robot um, <laughs> by sort of like by scientific method um, but yeah so, so in that paper it was really it's this idea that algorithms algor have values is, is the core of it um, so we're in, in our field of human computer interaction where everything has this, it's, a, it's always going to be positive and everything's always going to be used in the correct way and the world's going to be a better place for each new like, incremental improvement. Uh, and I'm just sort of saying that, well, a lot of the improvements are, you know, have kind of negative consequences. And I think things like Uber are an example of that now. So we wrote the paper long before uh, Uber became very popular. Uh, but, and Deliveroo as well, so there's this kind of ongoing... Um, issues of kind of labor issues uh, where kind of labor's organized by algorithms as you know what you know what happens in, in the real world when uh, when that kind of conflicts with uh, kind of well people's well-being um, and so yeah there's that kind of stuff that the paper kind of outlined but from this future perspective so we sort of said oh we were from 2063 and then we come back and said that maybe researchers should be more negative about their research or they should focus on exploring the potential negative uses of the new technology they've come up with uh, rather than always being the, the really positive angle, which is you know how we we see kind of technological development today. Um, so it had a serious message, but we always find that you know you can embed, and, and with our design projects as well, is you, you have this kind of serious point. But rather than just being kind of a dick about it and just saying I've made this thing that argues with your point, if you make it kind of funny and sort of uh, more accessible, then it kind of reaches a wider audience and people kind of understand uh, that kind of. Uh, that, that kind of broader perspective that you're trying to trying to bring. I just wonder about that point of inflection where it's no longer sort of bot systems um, that dominate us, but it's bot systems that start eating themselves. So for example, in academia, we've seen recently we had academic papers written by robots, and then it was, I think it was two weeks ago, a month ago, we started to see that the peer reviewers were also robots. So what was approving these things to be published in academic journals were bots. So then the question is, who is reading? I mean, it's always the question with academic research, who is ever reading my paper? But, but the, 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 almost this whole system is, is churning rather than producing. Is that, is that fair? I mean, for example, Val Harari's new book, Homo Deus, he's trying to argue that the, only, the most important reader that I have is not a human reader, it's the Google bot, the Google algorithm, because that ranks where my book appears so that my book is then purchased. I just wonder if we're starting to change our forms of communication specifically for a bot-enabled environment or a bot world where it... In academia, that, that, you're right, that does happen, and that is... That's because, so in the same way that they kind of, we can address those legal concerns because but the, the legal procedures are kind of very procedural and we can follow those. In academia, there is this kind of very procedural uh, like wet process that, that, that your papers go through. But also there's kind of a procedure of writing as well. So you write in a certain, certain kind of tone of voice and you write in a certain way and you use certain language that um, it turns out you, know, you can train <laughs> Uh, sort of simple, simple machines to, to emulate and, and to proceed this process. 
that has led to kind of you know billions of uh, fake articles being published in fake conferences. <laughs> so so like yeah, this does happen. And where, from an arts perspective, where does the fascination for bot-created content come from? We, we, ben mentioned that word anthropomorphism, yeah. the ability to see something very human in what is essentially very, very non-human. I just wonder, if, is that the key to what makes bots so compelling? I think, I mean, the answer is like obviously kind of individual to each, each individual bot. Um, so some, some of it is, yeah, like uh, recontextualizing it or just, just like it's funny in a way that you wouldn't expect or it gives you an unexpected insight. Um, like in the same way that like turning over tarot cards is, is a fascinating thing and an interesting thing. And the interesting thing is not that you've turned over this card, particularly it's, it's in the human connection that either you make looking at that tarot card and seeing how that relates to your life or in how, you know, a tarot card reader has, has done and saying interpreted this and connected it to this card and said yes no you've got this influences into your life and then this thing happens and you kind of fit it and you, you you know humans are great at like pattern matching and so you kind of overfit these patterns to to the data you see and so it definitely triggers off that and then also sometimes it's just like there's just a joy in like procedural generation of stuff there's a joy of like of, of the random number generator or of creating a system that can create you know however many billions of things, and some of those things are interesting, and seeing the ways those things vary and the way those parameters interact with each other in the way it gets curated is interesting as well. Um, yeah, and, uh, and sometimes it's just, oh, this has made a pretty thing, and the pretty thing looks different each time, so it's not like I'm just looking at one image and getting bored of it. So instead, I'm like, oh, look, there's lots of pretty things. That's nice. So then but, instead but, of the, these bots actually generating meaning or generating any Insight is us projecting, yeah, or so as humans, projecting meaning onto exactly, yeah. So it kind, kind of looks like us. So we, we that's kind of cute, or it's kind of yeah. evil, or ugly, or interesting, or and and also there's the sense of anthropomorphizing things and imagining that there's a there's a creature or a person out there creating it or projecting it onto it or just play acting with them as well. Like you know, like quite often you get this with people who've made like little bots of themselves and. The bot says something and you kind of say, oh, no, I disagree. And then they say something back and you pretend that that's sometimes it is a meaningful response. And you go argue back and you're kind of improvising with this kind of semi predictable system. So that's, the problem I have with that is that then instead of it being artificial intelligence that it relies on or any sort of insight that it relies on, it relies on the natural stupidity of human beings to go. It's not, it's oh, not stupidity, that's, though. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, I think that way of interacting with things, I mean, people are aware that what they're interacting with is not an intelligent thing, but they're play acting with it, they're having fun. And Twitter is especially good for this because you're doing it in public, so you're kind of performing for people. So it's like you're performing against some kind of semi, semi randomized prompts, or you're receiving insight and you're taking things seriously, or you're, you know, it's, it's playful, it's play, like, which, is, which I think is different from. I don't know, contextualizing it as like the stupidity of people or people being tricked by it or, or saying there's not something of value there. The, the, the value is what you've created with it and the value is even more so than, than normal non-algorithmic non works in like the meaning comes when, when you read the work and the meaning comes when you read a work even more so there because the work is new and fresh just, just for you, so the only person seeing it. And I wonder, Joshua, your, your bots don't try to exhibit personality at all, they're very, very functional based. And is that where you see the future of bot making going? More functional bots, let's leave this personality turn by the wayside, let's leave this chatbot stuff by the wayside, let's create systems that help us deal with systems in society. Or do you see multiple futures for bots? Well, um, interestingly, the number one thing that people say to my bot, on, I can see all the um, things people say on the back end. Uh, apart from the fact that I got a parking ticket, they also say thank you. And um, I always wonder why people say, they sometimes write these long and articulate thank you messages, and then the bot just responds with this pro forma, always happy to help. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so I think, as you said, people are kind of um, missing the concept um, of bots. And so there has to be some level of human kind of um, anthropomorphism. Um, so I think the future of bots is a slight human characteristic, but not 
like a general, like empathetic human. So is there a, is there a sweet spot for creating bots for 2016? I mean, in, in 2011, it felt like everybody wanted to stick a blasted bot in a fridge. But for 2016, is there a, a new emerging sweet spot in where bot cultures, if we want to call it those sort of things, bot concepts, where, where, they, where it exists right now, where, it, where we are right now? Before we get to that, can, can we ask you about Infomorphs and You can ask me about Infomorphs. So <laughs> I'm trying, to, <laughs> trying to be a professional idiot. I know you tried to pass, idiot, it, you tried uh, to pass it off right at the start there, but because we're talking about anthropomorphism and uh, so yeah, your Infomorphs or Weavers, which were uh, explicitly kind of uh, human-like agents that you could interact with. I mean, so, so as, as you were designing those, were, were you... Um, like trying to make them as, as realistic and as, as human as possible, or, or like where was the balance for you? So just just for context, so I have a weird history back into bots through a company called Weavers. Um, it was a company owned by a gentleman called David Balsola, and uh, the co-founder of this com uh, of Virtual Futures, Dan O'Hara, and I worked as freelance researchers on behalf of Weavers uh, during 2011 for about six months. We wrote a, a thesis on something called infomorphology, which um, is actually a term originally used by uh, the AI researcher, the Russian AI researcher, the late Russian AI researcher, Alexander Chislenko, um, who used this term infomorph, um, an entity whose morphology is made up of information. Um, and an infomorph would essentially be a being who would have no physical body, so it could exist completely online. And Dan and I were helping what was essentially a, a company who were selling market research tools uh, do more interesting stuff with these bots. So we were doing everything from putting uh, software personalities into uh, Rumba Hoovers. So you'd have the software personality of um, Mary Poppins in a Rumba Hoover, and she'd be practically perfect in every way. It was very, very basic keyword recognition back in 2011. Um, the, the company, um, again, we weren't necessarily directly involved with, but the company won an American Advertising Award for, for creating something called uh, DigiVigils, which was then a product, uh, I think, still sold by a company called Brain Juicer here in London. Uh, we were doing more artistic side, which was how do, you, how do you deal with this tricky issue of personality? And how do you deal with the fact that humans will always project meaning? And we were finding what it really was, was the mechanomorphism of the human, the fact that because, and these things only exist on Twitter, the fact that we as human beings reduce our mode of communication to only 140 characters, and then we hashtag that stuff up. So if you actually look at a lot of your own tweets, you look and behave very robotically. And when you're already behaving as a human individual robotically on a platform, it's very, very, very easy to mimic that behavior, and we were paper prototyping, Dan and I were paper prototyping, what does that, how do you identify personality and behavior? Behavior being how many times a day would these bots tweet based on where you're geolocated, and then uh, uh, personality was based on what you would tweet about. And the system was basically reading everybody else's tweets with similar demographic data and then feeding back. And then we had individuals across the world who were essentially uh, creating a happy version of themselves where they would keyword for like me, but very, very happy, and it would always be in these parties and these raves, whereas the, uh, the flip side of that was um, uh, you'd have a sad version of yourself that would go to dive bars. Now, the most interesting work, at least from my opinion, where those bots um, were seen as having something very nuanced and very, something very uh, anthropomorphic is when we put them into objects. And we still have low expectations. I still feel we have low expectations of what we were going to receive there and back off social platforms. I think it's why a lot of these chatbots are working, personally. I mean, I always try on these bloody panels to sit there and go, I'm an idiot, not an expert. Um, but I think when we started, I mean, one of our uh, product that never really came to fruition because of the situation with the company, which is now defunct and the founders disappeared. If anybody knows where he is, I'd love to know because so are the bloody lawyers. Um, but uh, we had a product essentially, um, or we were going to have a product which was a, uh, a dildo um, that would have software personality inserted into it. So uh, essentially the guys saw what we were doing the Rumba Hoovers, came up to us and went, what you're doing is manipulating motors based on keyword recognition. Could you create a sex toy with a software personality? Of course, it was a male gentleman who was driving this sort of idea of the future of sex. And essentially, you download your software personality 
Web Connect or USB Connect your dildo and you could have an experience with Justin Bieber. We had a working prototype of George Clooney, which was scraped from the Wikipedia page for George Clooney. And then that was put into, I think it was going to be put into a Sarsi, which is essentially a robot tongue that learns what you like. So I think there's something about embodiment still. I still think we haven't hit the embodiment phase. Um, and then you know some of the more playful stuff Dan and I are looking at with regards to you know, how do you get these things legal rights? So what you're dealing with right now with these bots is something that arguably has intention. So, uh, I mean, this was a couple of years later after this project whereby we're seeing that these bots, essentially, we could trick them into shouting to humans, don't kill me, don't kill me, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. You can sort of trick that personality inside of a robotic system. Now, in, uh, in UK and US law, there's something called natural and artificial persons, artificial persons being corporations, how far could you go in actually um, giving a bot entity legal status by connecting it to an artificial person, a corporation? So you'd have a software personality that would run a corporation, and what would it buy? Well, it would buy a natural person, it would start buying organs so it could actually generate its own body, essentially. And artificial persons, as in the US, have certain rights, so you start to have bots that have rights, that exist in environments whereby, you know, can we kill them? And arguably the question is no, because if we look at how natural uh, personhood is seen in law right now, a zygote, a uh, 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 fetus at 40 days, can be, um, and I'm, I'm uh, pro-choice, um, it can be uh, aborted purely because it doesn't have a heartbeat, oh, sorry, it has a heartbeat but it has no intentionality. Now if a bot, has intentionality but no heartbeat, can it be aborted, so, so for say. So that's the kind of playful area to kind of reveal uh, my little bias within regards to how we think about bots. Um, that's kind of where I stand. I think there's something very, very interesting. I still think we're caught at that Twitter bot phase. There's my little thesis on infomorphology. Damn you, Ben. <laughs> that's not very fair. But let me return to some questions. Uh, look, I... I want to return to that issue of, do you think, because of these bot systems, are we getting to the stage where we expect less of human beings because of expecting more from bots? Are we going to get to the stage where we don't phone a, phone a automated system instead of sitting there on the phone going, I want a human, and actual fact, if you swear three times, they put you straight through to a human in some system. But instead of saying, I don't, want, I, don't want a, I don't want a bot, I want a human, will we ever get to the stage where we go, you know what, I don't want a blasted human, I want a bot, because that's the most efficient way to deal with my issue. Will we ever get to that turn where we start thinking less of humans and more of bots? I just wonder your guys' opinion on that before we open it up to this expert audience. I, from my perspective, I guess it depends on utility. So, you know, do not pay is a great example. Is uh, you know, you might not wish to go and see, even if it was free, would you like, wish to go and seek legal advice and go somewhere and have a conversation about your particular status, where you can have this kind of convenient and uh, a personal conversation with a robot lawyer that's able to kind of resolve your situation very quickly, especially in kind of personal cases like the homelessness. Um, is you know where where there's a utility you know we'll, we'll seek that out. But you know when there's something goes wrong for me with a corporation, I I still go to Twitter first, like a lot of people. You know you don't phone up the helpline and make a complaint. You go on Twitter because that's how you get a response within 15 minutes from a human about whatever it is. Um, so yeah, is it like it is going to depend? That's, that's kind of a crap answer. It's, it depends. And, and George, will we ever get to that stage when we expect less of humans and more like, of bots? I mean, certainly in those cases, yeah, like you want whatever, whatever works best, like it's, I mean, it's just, it's just, just system design and whether, whether the best way to design the system to, I don't know, like I've just moved house, so like, it's design the system to like cancel your internet. If I could just go online and cancel it really simply, I'd do that rather than ring some people up. But instead, I know that the best way to do it is to ring some people up and actually talk on the phone. And occasionally you get a more complicated situation, so you do need, do need a person, but if the website could resolve that, and I believed that, then then that would be fine. But I don't know. That's that's kind of a I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that always makes me think there's deliberate latency. Oh yeah, it's yeah, the totally. same as canceling that bloody Netflix account, thirty day trial. Yeah. there's deliberate latency built into the system, and I wonder, Josh, is is that what your work is trying to do? Reveal those deliberate latencies that pre-exist in these systems? Yeah. 
And actually, there are these really great bots that actually do exactly that, cancel your subscriptions that have just come out. I can't remember what they're called. Um, but there's this really interesting trend, I think, where they have people pretending to be bots, pretending to be people. And um, I think that just shows, for example, x.ai, which is a company that's a virtual assistant, they actually send all your requests um, to someone online who actually types out the answer, and they advertise themselves as a bot. And I think that just shows how people actually prefer, in some situations, to deal with a bot. Why would these companies be advertising themselves as bots otherwise? Well, then the question is, is it a Turk system on the back end? So exactly, there's been yeah. massive issues. So again, to not assume expertise across the entire um, VF uh, audience, I know some of you are massive experts and some of you are coming in from an entirely different background, but Mechanical Turk being you get a human to do very, very basic actions, probably the best example of that is, I always pronounce it wrong, Captica, Captica, we... Yeah. Capture, where you basically you, you have to identify all the tigers in the, in the grid pattern and then you get to sign in, I am not a robot, sign into your, into your system. The problem that's now occurring with some of those mechanical Turk systems is that there is something very human and humane, and especially Amazon's web mechanical Turk, whereby you have individuals who are based on the other side of the planet doing very, very menial tasks for you, we're finding that they're starting to email individuals who are using these systems going, I am a mother of three, I'm not getting paid enough, please pay me more for my task because these entire systems are set up to, rather than help, but disenfranchise the individuals actually doing those bot Like this, tasks. This is actually, I think, as important as like whether it's, whether it's a bot or not or a different system is more in order to set up these things, it, it takes resources and takes away work. So it, what it does is it concentrates power in the people who are able to you know, do big data and analyze huge data sets and, and set up these platforms. So it, it concentrates power into, the, into these companies and it, just to get Marxist here, like, you know, it, it means that capital can accumulate, accumulate more money without, without needing labor, without needing to pay people to do this. And like, that's, that's the credo of a lot of these kind of Silicon Valley companies is like, to hit scale, like in order to go from, you know, a thousand users to 10 million users without having to hire many more people. Like that's, that's, that's what scale means is like we hire twice as many people and we can serve a hundred times more people, which means we make a whole shit ton of money. That's, that's, that's the point of that. So I think, yeah, where it really rests for me is like that balance of power and how that balance of power shifts as companies have this way of gaining lots more information on us. But we don't have more information on them. We don't have more options. And like in terms of if people have their own personal bots, like, well, who has their own personal bots? Like the people who buy, who are able to buy the latest iPhone as soon as it comes out will have access to this technology first. And then that's a way of, of yeah, reinforcing inequalities. Well, that's what, Josh, when I show your project, that was the thing that made it so interesting was the fact that, okay, we can now use bot systems not to stick personalities into dildos, but to actually fundamentally change the tide of how do we, yeah. how do we interact with, with companies, corporations, systems more generally. And think about some of your tools, George, and, and the work that you're doing, then revealing and being able to give people the tools to create not software personalities that can go check into, you know, bars on my behalf on the day off or into health food restaurants while I'm sitting in the pub, but how do we fundamentally use bot systems for our good rather than allow um, us just to check into hotels, which I think is, is something interesting in that. And on that note, I want to bounce this out into the audience because there's a lot flying around in the air there, and I just want to know if there's any questions at all. Please let there be questions. Please. I was just wondering, once your bots are, bots are created, are they easy or possible to hack? And if they were hacked, it would make the same sort of different things. Yeah. How easy would it be for you to pick up on that if the other person, the human person, didn't communicate to you? So the question is with regards to security and hacking, how do we, how do we stop that within bot systems? Mm -hmm. So I guess, Joshua, you've had some experience of that recently. <laughs> Yeah, it's a huge issue. Um, every other week, someone tries to hack Do Not Pay, either by trying to take it down or trying to interfere with its answers. And um, th the way I notice is either it stops working or um, I look at all the responses on the back end. I can't look at every response because it's too much, but I try and look for trends to see if it's hacked. But it's a really big issue. Do you, can you track who and why? Do you just think it's because it's 
I mean, I, I can't imagine it's the you know the local councils because they can't even get half the things right in in, in technology. But do, do you know potentially the reasons why for it's being hacked? I think internet culture is really strange, and people like to hack things for the challenge. Um, I hope that's the reason, and I'm not really angering someone and making some powerful enemies. Anonymous actually supported the site um, in a statement, so at least they're on my side. <laughs> I'm scared of you. Okay, all right. <laughs> and then, and George, that question with regards to it, yeah, no, is I this mean, like fun when they do get hacked? Is this like well, I mean, like so. Luckily, luckily, I've not had that happen. But I mean, actually. Just because I'm, I'm doing this alongside like working working games as a, as a day job and everything, I designed the whole thing to be as like low maintenance as possible. And part of that means I still haven't really got good like logging and monitoring set up. So largely, I do actually rely on people just messaging me on Twitter and saying, "Oh yeah, it's, it's down." I'm like, "Oh yeah, shit, shit, sorry, I'll fix it." Um, so yeah, hopefully I'll be able to fix that. But I mean, also. I mean, especially with Twitter bots and stuff, like you get limited permissions through Twitter. So if everything if everything totally goes tits up, I'll go into Twitter and then say, oh yeah, no, turn it off, turn it off. Just say cancel everything, revoke all these permissions, and then the site will people who set up bots will be dead, but people won't be able to steal those steal those authorizations. From my perspective, it's just careful design. Is I think it's something we touched on before when we were talking about Microsoft Tay, but is the you know just considering all these edge possibilities and I think you are like a standard kind of web security almost. It's like what what are the potential vectors people can take and interfere with the system? So in the case of Tay, like does it does it reply to people and then does it does it collect the text that's been given to it somehow? It should have been seen straight away as kind of a vector for abuse. Um, so and, and the same with someone using uh, Cheatbox done quick, is that the way we end? Yeah. Which is, you know, if, if it could import text back from Twitter into its own, you know that that would be kind of, you know, room for, for, for hacking. But you can't do that at the moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, careful design, um, hoping for the best. <laughs> yeah, keeping your fingers crossed. Any other questions? And so please. Um, so I heard about um, Facebook's bot platform with the M. Uh, it had humans behind the scenes helping it out. Yeah. yeah. What do you guys feel about kind of humans assisting the machine in answering questions? Is it cheating? Is it a valid kind of stepping stone towards something? Um, yeah, no, I think it's I think it's valid. Or like I, I'm a big fan of um, there's one bot actually which was made through Cheatbots uh, called Crypt Ebooks. And what it does is it generates um, these little descriptions of like a dungeon room, like a D and D kind of like you've entered a room with like vaulted high ceilings. There's a warlock here, um, stuff like that. Um, but then some people started responding to it and saying like, uh, yes, yes, I, I I fight the warlock. And then, but the p person who made it was signed into the account, so they saw these notifications, and so would then just respond in character. Um, and so, like, I love I love these kind of things. I mentally call, kind of call them cyborgs, like where it's where it's. I mean, and that's that's way more fun, like, than just a human improvising this stuff or just a bot happening there and able to riff off this kind of thing in an interesting way. So, I mean, certainly for, for my sort of stuff, that's that's perfectly valid, and I. I mean, like we said, it's kind of it comes down to kind of careful design, and if the best way to achieve things is actually just to have people doing it to do the tricky things, then that's fine. Like, um, I mean, I could imagine a version of like some of Josh's services where, you know, you do it, and if it gets complicated, it fails out and says, right here, here is a lawyer online now responding to you, connected up. That that would be great design. Probably not affordable in terms of hiring lawyers, but you know. Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's different layers of human involvement as well. So something I wanted to highlight was that you know those algorithms were made by people. So um, you know, if a, if a bot's live online, you can still be tweaking those algorithms behind the scenes to you know to do more of something or less of something else. So although there might not be kind of this direct you know, responding as the robot, you know, you can it, it can still be kind of steered and controlled, and you know that happens an awful lot. I'd right. Guess. Like there's a kind of sliding scale from like people who have templates to respond to stuff on Gmail? Like, is that a robot? They're not typing all that text. <laughs> and also, I think it's like a double-edged sword. Um, with what Facebook were doing was they were using the humans to actually train the robot so that 10 years into the future, it can be 100% automated. I think if you do it, have a long-term view of using humans, then perhaps that's cheating. And ultimately, it's not scalable. The thing I love about robots is that they're instant and you don't have to pay people. Robots don't have to be paid, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so much.
there's, there's going to be a robot lawyer, robot lawyer fighting for robo uh, this, yeah. employment yeah. rights. Employment rights. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the big part of that is transparency. If you're transparent from the outset, that's great. There was there was a lot of discussion around when Siri launched. The massive issue was the fact that this thing was buggy as hell. The original founding team, the, the stories, a lot of those split because of the fact that it was released too early, but the reason it was released too early was voice data, voice data, voice data, voice data, voice data, and there was an article today with regards to Google Voice captures everything, and there was an independent article this morning, Google Voice captures everything you ever do, and say to your web browser, you can go and find all that voice data if you want, it's using it to learn. Now, to your argument, then if it's helping those things to learn, then what's the issue? But transparency, certainly in my opinion, is the key. You've got to be open to the fact that anything could be talking back to you, essentially. Any other questions at all? Please. Some really open-ended questions. Um, so Google, they announced recently that they're moving from a mobile-first company to an AI-first company. Yeah. What's that mean to you? What do you think that means to consumers? What do they actually mean by that? Well, these guys would agree that if AI is used, then fuck, they got nothing. Uh, yeah, it's really open. But what's your thoughts on that? How do you interpret? Ah, that, like, I think that's interesting because I've always thought of Google as being, I don't know, AI and computer research driven. Like, I mean, from the start, it was like, cool, we've got a really cool algorithm, and then that's what that's what Google itself was built on. Um, so I don't know, like, yeah, that makes sense. I think that what they're trying to say is, um, I think AI, like we said, is magic that they're trying to like hype. But um, what they mean is that they want it to think more and more and really improve the algorithm. They want you to get up and open up Google and see all your appointments and have a car waiting for you that's organized by Google. So I think they just want to improve their algorithm and they're using this AI term to make it magic. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just like a signifier, I guess, of rather than being kind of shackled to a particular device or, um, or yeah, so it was web browser or mobile. Now they're just, oh yeah, we're, we're shackled to the future and it'll always be in the future. So you know, it, wor it works you know, from a, that kind of high level corporate perspective. I think what we were seeing early days with Google Now and the ability to create a cloud around you, almost like a layer of sticky data onto you. The problem is we're still in lock-in systems whereby nothing's sharing, you know, which was the possibility of bots back in 2011, which is let's create different versions of yourself just to mess with all this stuff that's tracking us. It's funny that we were sort of working for a company that was getting its bread and butter essentially from market research tools that required you to have a coherent version of you, and then on the back end, the sort of artist researchers wanted to create multiple versions of you to mess with those sort of systems that are trying to programmatically buy ads against your personality and who you are and track you cookie-wise through the web. Now, everybody wants to be the, the, the monkey on your back going, this guy likes this, this guy likes this. You know, but these systems aren't integrated yet. We haven't got that. And more importantly, we don't own that. Now, the new uh, the frontier for where that we have the potentiality to demand it is in biodata, and my friend, and I hope he bloody wins as well, is Conor Russomano, who runs a company called OpenBCI, and the front end of his company really is around how do you create devices to allow you to generate and create uh, neuro data, so brainwave data, and he has basically created an open source hardware device that allows you to create, uh, capture uh, EEG data. Now, that's just one part of the business. The interesting thing that he's exploring is what does it mean when you start generating that sort of data? Who owns it? How do you own it? And how do you micro sell it back? So he's paper prototyping models whereby he has a, a $200 kit essentially. It's a 3D printed EEG headset with an EEG chip on the back. It's about $250 all in. The only place you're going to wear an EEG headset is sitting at home typing on your computer. And what do you do for a large percentage of that time? Where you sit and you stare and you scroll through your social networks, your Twitter and your Facebook. And the thing they care the most about is attention data. And all they have right now is heat maps or the similar for scrolling. You scroll down, you stop. Are you looking at a content? What defines engagement? Now, if you could micro-sell your attention data 
back to Facebook, you can go value neutral on that device in what he hopes would be six months. Everyone can have an EEG device. You sell it back to Facebook. They pay you for insight into your attention data. I mean, the irony is uh, the metric of attention is so debated in actual fact you can get spikes in alpha wave by just closing your eyes, which is also the, the brain wave that drives attention. So that's where personally I worry when with these clouds are built around our bio data, our neuro data, our body data, where does it live? Well, it should live on us. And as anybody who knows me personally, let's chip ourselves up and store it on there. Uh, but that's my personal opinion. But then the question is, what are they going to do with it? Create new product, which is great. But then the question is, what can we do with it? Which is why what these gentlemen are doing here by giving these tools, democratizing these tools, how do we unlock the data, be able to see the data and then go, what do I do with it that's more interesting than say, you know, neuro artworks or flying drones through headset devices? Well, we're about to be given all of this data and we're going to go, you know what, I know what the bloody hell I'm going to do with it, give it to my doctor or put it somewhere else and, and we're just going to give it to whoever wants it, quite frankly, because that's what we've done, that's the habitual way of dealing with social networks. We've got to, we've got to change that paradigm, that's the way we win in that environment. Personal opinion. My opinions are not of the company, but, but whatever. All right, any other questions or so? Please. Other than the fact that Google and Facebook aren't so dominant in China, why do you think WeChat is so, so much further ahead than well, any sort of social platform is in the West? I don't know. It's <laughs> a very good question. So, yeah, so here in. So, we'll start with um, Microsoft Hay. So, we're talking about how, that were, how badly that went, but it only went really badly in the West. So, you know, Microsoft's other bot that they had running in, in China was, you know, Successful by all by all accounts. Um, so I know about that. That's interesting. Uh, so who knows? But I mean, yeah, I don't really have enough experience with uh, the Chinese market. I guess. Yeah. No, I've not not seen WeChat. I mean, I would assume it is the similar kind of reason that stuff works here in terms of just has a lot of lock in, and once you know, once something becomes the standard, then the most useful thing to do is to support that. So then it reinforces it being, being the standard. So I don't know. But that's just that's just a guess. I mean, I've never been to China, but I have quite strong opinions um, about this. I think that WeChat, um, because of, I think it's actually because of bots. Like, if you walk into a hotel with WeChat, um, a bot pops up on WeChat and checks you in. And I think in China they have such limited. That not everyone has iPhones in China, so I think the fact is that you can have one app that does so many things for you. And whether that's the ideal experience is debatable, but because it can do so much for you, users don't have the data or the smartphone to download many apps, so they have to rely on WeChat. Joshua is spot on. And, and the other hidden side of my life is the, the freelance work I did with large brands, unfortunately. And WeChat was massive purely because they had the full chain of command. They had an ecosystem generated around a messenger app. You could purchase from it. You could uh, you, and issue that purchase within the app. Uh, QR codes were massive. In, in Asia purely because they were the trigger for buying thing, everything from, in my case, it was 10 months of Oreos from a vending machine. That was what WeChat was used for, but no one could do the full integrated ecosystem that was designed around the app. And the way in which you're talking about, you walk in and it, and it pings you down. Twitter are desperately and were desperately trying to get there, whereby you walk into a hotel and they know you're there. The geolocated data says, oh, hi, thank you for checking out our hotel. Please follow XX and X and please, um, uh, engage with us and here's a free drink or something for your hotel room. You know, everybody's trying to make their ecosystem the ecosystem through which you navigate the world. Everybody wants to bring the web and overlay that onto the world. The question is, will it be done through stack culture? Will it be done through a, a stack of Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, Foursquare's, a, Foursquare's gone. That's the crazy thing. It's swarm now and whatever. But um, I blasted hope it's not a stack. Marks of friends, bloody hope is a stack. So you can track you and target you and you just push stuff at you and we know your profile for advertising, but I mean, all of this becomes less interesting when it's purely about moving an ad dollar or media dollar, in my opinion, anyway. I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to be that. I mean, I've spam works because these are companies that are not going to be able to compete. 
So it's like Siri apparently listens to everything that you ask it and keeps it. The stupid thing is I've got a Siri and you know I'm a serious writer but I don't take it seriously that. I've asked it what its favourite movie is, whether it loves me, all sorts of things. <laughs> it's, um, oh yeah, and, and to um, uh, opening, uh, it's all, all silly things. But I think if you've got competing brands, you've got Google and you've got Apple and you've got Microsoft now, all the time I wanted to do that. And I don't think it's going, nobody's got all of it. Nobody's got all of it and it's what you do with the different, different things. I think the, the one thing I do is I really do want to make one of these. <laughs> oh, yeah, please do. Let me know if you've got any questions. Yeah. I definitely want to do one. But the other thing is, what about a uh, personality and uncanny value? How human do, do they want to be? Because when things are too pseudo human, they don't get engagement. We want to talk to the robot, we want to say thank you to Siri. But we don't really want it to be a person, do we? Will we ever get to Spike John's level of her, I'm in love with a, essentially a chatbot? You, you do, you think then? <laughs> well, <laughs> so I don't know what relationship, I don't know what you've been asking, Siri, but... Uh, yeah, no, but... I, so, so a question for you then is, uh, so when, when you're speaking to Siri, uh, do you imagine it as a person or... So, are you just are you just testing it to to see if the algorithms know how to respond? Or? Right, right. Oh, okay. I might, I might ask it something, mm. but uh, and occasionally I will use Google to give it directions so that it can track what I've got. But I know I don't treat it like a person. I mm. just I, I, I ask it facts, and then people say, "Oh, ask it something." So I'm like, <laughs> "What's your favourite movie, Siri?" Yeah. <laughs> And it comes up with two answers. It either goes, I don't know what you mean, Joanna. And I'm like, you know what you mean, <laughs> Siri. And then it, oh, it says, I've heard 2001 is a good movie. Uh, okay. So it has a sense of humor. Mm. But that's, but no, it's people, when people are interacting professionally with, mm. with the bot. They want, they don't want it to be truly human. Mm. It's, a, it's a thing of making it compelling. So it's the uncanny valley thing that people don't want it to be too close to human because we know it is. Well, but we yeah. want to be able to say thank you. We want a sort of a human response. Well, it's, it's, it's so also... That's where I'm saying, where, where do you sit with how human you're going to make? Well, like with a lot of that stuff, like if you're actually interacting with a human, you have to like care about their feelings and like consider them, whereas with the machine you don't have to, like, it's a much simpler model. You can you can just demand it things for hours on an end and you don't need to worry. Like, are you tired actually? Do you want to drink some water? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's much nicer. And Joshua, are actually nodding away as Joanna was speaking. Yeah. I, I, think, um, I think that's a perfect answer. I really agree with that. I think that the line is drawn on one end where you have to say, press one to have, no one can deal with that. But on the other hand, you don't want to be getting water for a robot. So I think the line is perfectly drawn at caring for someone and like actually having a long-term relationship with it. So I've got, uh, it made me think of when you question um, about the NASA mission, or sorry, the, the, the Drone Space Expedition, or whoever it was with the Rosetta and Philae, which is the, you know, the, the space mission to, to land a probe on the comet, uh, which succeeded recently. Uh, but what's, what's really fascinating and infuriating for me is on Twitter, if you, follow, you can follow Philae and Rosetta is the spaceship, but they have characters. So they, 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 they tweet as like, so they talk to each other and they go, hey, how are you? Are you? And, and they just recently found the, the probe and it's like, oh, you found me. Thank, thank God, it's like, this is like a multi-billion dollar, you know, piece of, piece of kind of research. It's spent like years and years of, kind of hours have got into making this thing and it's kind of reduced to this kind of like, cutesy uh, interaction on, on Twitter. And so I kind of like, wonder, like that, that's maybe the opposite, is, is kind of uh, you know, projecting these kind of cute characters on, on top of uh, like complicated machines that, that, you know, that, that don't have them. You know, Philae doesn't have uh, like a, a conversation engine or kind of some kind of human like AI. It's interacted with, you know, based on, you know, just numbers over, over radio waves or whatever. But, but yeah, the, the, like, post facto, it has this kind of thing applied to it is, I don't know, it's, it's weird to me, but I don't know what you guys think is about that. that. 
you said it, Ben, on the phone, the, the cat stroking issue. Is it the fact that we do exactly <laughs> the same with yeah. our animals? Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, currently I'm working on the dog internet, which is uh, <laughs> like a whole different topic. But in, in working with animal behavioral scientists, uh, uh, it's, it's just really amazed me as kind of the, 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 the difference between the way we, uh, the way animals are and the way we interpret their behavior. So, you know, the classic one is like, for a lot of cats, stroking is very stressful. Um, but, you know, the, the cat will allow itself to be stroked because it knows that, you know, the human's going to feed it. So you've got the situation where the human believes that it's stroking the cat because the cat likes it, but the cat's only getting stroked because it knows it'll get fed, like if, if it allows itself to be stroked. Uh, and I think the same is true with kind of AI is this kind of massive gulf between what people project onto uh, the AI or, or, the an or the animal in that, in that same kind of way. Uh, I think we, like, you touched on it briefly before, George, was the, that kind of that pattern matching is oh, the dog smiling. You know, it's exactly the same thing. As it, and then you know, people will swear blindly that you know, their cat is grumpy or whatever. It's like, well, you know, grumpy is a very complex, you know, we don't even know if, you, if animals are capable of forming such complex emotions as kind of like anger and revenge. It's, you know, it's beyond our understanding at the moment. And, and, and but that happens with bots as well. So, there's a there's a question like right over there, this guy. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm unconvinced by a large amount of the bot hype. Um, has anyone actually studied whether humans and whether it's changing prefer to either be autonomous and just get off and do stuff themselves, whether they want to have technology just do stuff quietly in the background. Yeah, what proportion of tasks do we want to have some sort of dialogue rather than either do it yourself or have someone do it and don't have to So why do we have to chat to these things? Why can't they just if they know what our answer is gonna be, if they're good enough to know the answer, then why don't they just get on and do it on our behalf? Yeah. I think again, like going back to what George said earlier about you know th things are only AI and you know until they're a feature, in which case they, they just disappear and just become. So like when you search on Google Images for an image and it uses some complicated pattern recognition, is you know it, it, it's disappeared away from being this important feature that you interact with directly uh, into being this kind of passive thing. Um, so so I guess it's you know it, it is this hype cycle. So maybe they will just kind of vanish out of sight again. Has they become normalised? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I, I think it's more nuanced than that. I'm thinking of, I, I, let's say, booking a flight. I, you know, I don't want to have an interrogation of, well, where do you want to go, or how much do you want to do? Just give me a search engine for flights, and let me go on the head. Or let me ask someone, can you get me a flight to Guatemala? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I agree. Like, the conversational UI is a UI pattern for achieving tasks like that. It's super hyped right now and it's kind of weird like WeChat which was the initial kind of stimulus for a lot of this stuff actually it's the way it does it is kind of different it just has buttons for a lot of this stuff like it gives you these options and then it's like cool let's just push the button for the thing you want and it kind of abstracts out all of the kind of typing typing response and then it gives you a thing and said it you can get through it a lot faster and it, uh, yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's hype, it's, it's going to crash down, but, but there's also others, other ways of interacting with it which do use this. And I mean, in terms of artistic stuff, in terms of like other ways to interact with it, other stuff that isn't so task oriented, and even some tasks which are well suited for it. Like, I don't know, it's a tool everyone's a bit excited about right now um, that I think will fade away. But there are some, some, so actually, some cases where I think it is useful is. Um, I'm, I quite like some like Slack bots where you can ask a question to a thing, like say, "Hey, what's the status of this?" But the important thing there is you're doing it in a like a, you're doing it in a channel where you're in with multiple other people. So, you know, if I go into a team and say, "Hey, what's happening with this task?" I'm doing it in a space where five other people are online and can see it. So instead of me going at a web page, seeing what the task is, then copying and pasting it into that window. So instead, I've performed asking for the task and getting a response for that for those people, and so. In that case, having a bot there to respond makes sense and gives you a flow that you wouldn't have otherwise. Or reminders in the same channel. Like, it reminds me, but it also tells everyone else that I've just been reminded of a thing. That makes sense. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, um, when Facebook released their platform, 
as a naive kind of teenager, I thought everything is going to change and like there'll be so many useful bots. But I've actually agree with you and have been quite disappointed. I think 90% of the bots that are out there, there's no need for a bot. Like who needs a bot to order flowers or order pizza? You can just phone up or go on a search engine on Domino's. And so I think the difference with some of the bots like do not pay is that um, it makes issues less complicated rather than more complicated. Like with parking tickets, there are a million ways to say the parking bay was too small, but only one legal defense. And, and so if the bot is actually simplifying things rather than complicating them, I think that's where the line should be drawn. And I think for 90% of issues, um, it complicates things and it won't be necessary. This Microsoft Clippy is yeah. something that, you know, comes back time again. So maybe a lot, a lot of the arguments for chatbots at the moment are just kind of mobile. So when you're on mobile, you know, maybe you can't open your complicated flight search engine and check out all the options you'd like to. So maybe the bot would be easier. Uh, but it definitely yeah, feels like at the moment like they've not got close to, to making that, that work very well for me anyway. But then a bunch of the bot thing is you typing and it's like, well, typing's rubbish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so any last questions? Um, so with the stuff that I see, I take a kind of fairly strong position with almost everything I've seen that the responsibility for what the bot's actions is, is on the creator of the bot. Um, so they have to take responsibility for it and like obviously that can involve taking a risk, like artistically or just with, with the behavior of it. But ultimately, if you've made a thing, if you've got control over it, if you can turn it off at any time, you have responsibility for its actions. So I don't, I don't think you can just say, no, the, the bot should take into account of it. Or maybe it does, but you're taking into account of it and saying, I'm put it out here, but it's, there's some safeguards. So it tries to do a thing, it tells itself not to. So. Um, people always say that you should never worry about bots because the owner can just turn it off or um, the owner is making money so it's not an un unemployment issue. But like we were talking about before, if bots have rights and they can own themselves, then what creator can you hold into account? So I think we just need to be careful about um, firstly designing bots in the first place so that they are, and hold, so that they are ethical and um, hold the programmers accountable, even if bots can't own themselves. So on a kind of darker example is, we've just started to see the first deaths from automatic driving cars. And so seeing like how the manufacturers of those features kind of respond to those and say, oh, you know, the, the user didn't have the, the hands in the right position on the wheel and is kind of going to be ind indicative of how um, these kind of issues like, play out longer term. So watch out for the cars. So on that, no, um, I just want to thank a couple of people. As always, I want to thank Swara Kadir um, for filming and also Matthew Barrell, who has been involved with VF since 2011, is constantly here, is a massive both mental and physical supporter of mine. Thank you, Matthew, for everything you do. Kevin Thompson, our audio guy who makes it um, possible for us to record everything we record. Um, unfortunately, I edit everything, so it doesn't always go online. I think I'm about four four salons behind right now. Um, anyone wants to help us with editing, uh, please please let us know. But we release everything Creative Commons. If you want any use of the video, please let us know. We we're happy to, for it to be used in any research, any projects that you may uh, have. Also, thanks go to Dr. Dan O'Hara and uh, Tom Ward who aren't here. Um, they're both up uh, north today. Um, who've been pinnacle in thinking about everything that's really contributed to this panel, including um, the panelists who are sitting here today. And I just want to remind the attendees that if you love what we're doing at VF, we're always on the hunt for um, ideas for panels. Um, hopefully, we're going to continue the uh, collaboration we have with Lights of Soho. And we're also looking for uh, sponsors and partners. The reason I have to have a secret freelance life of brand work is because that's what uh, predominantly funds, um, funds virtual futures at the moment, which is a pain in the ass. But anyway, let me just say this. Today, you've met the guy who accidentally got into the robo-law business. I hope you also uh, find the joy in the procedural generation of stuff. And whatever you do, do not trust directions from Ben. And let me end with this. The future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. 
Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and in those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that tonight. The bar is now open. Please join me in thanking these fantastic panelists.